Hey everyone, it's me, Mike Lampanich, your sissy. Welcome to All Things Billy the Kid. So glad you could join me today, as always. Today we're going to talk about the famous or infamous coroner's jury report in the death of Billy the Kid. And uh, few documents have sparked so much controversy uh, over the years as this document, if it even exists anymore, other than in uh, photostatic copies. Um, but I thought first it would be interesting to look up what a coroner's jury is actually tasked with doing. And this from the Encyclopedia Britannica, a coroner's jury, a group summoned from a district to assist a coroner in determining the cause of a person's death. The number of jurors generally ranges from six to 20. Um, even in countries where the jury system is strong, the coroner's jury, which originated in medieval in England, is a disappearing form. Now, here's an important part. The coroner's jury resembles the grand jury in that it does not try cases, but rather reviews evidence that may be relevant at a trial. The jury's verdict states how, when, and where the deceased died. If the jury concludes that the deceased died by murder or manslaughter, it can name suspects and the coroner can order arrest and detainment pending grand jury action. So the coroner's jury is a fact-finding uh, entity that is formed for a specific purpose uh, at a specific time. And because it's the coroner, it means somebody died, right? It's not, you don't get it for, for a, uh, you know, a traffic accident where somebody, you know, got a scratch on their arm. There's no coroner's jury for breaking and entering. It's only when the coroner, that means that there's a deceased person uh, when the coroner is called in. Uh, so the coroner's jury has no power to indict. All they can do is present evidence and name suspects um, and and the cause of death. So this suspect used this method to kill this person. That's our verdict. Okay. Um, not used very much anymore, but in some situations um, they still are, but much more popular, I guess, um, back in the day. Uh, Ollinger and Bell killed by uh, the kid April 28, 18. 81, uh, there was a, a coroner's jury or inquest held over their bodies. Wendy Cahill, whose grave I just went and marked a few weeks back in Bonita, Arizona, coroner's jury uh, over the, the body or the person of Wendy Cahill. They actually took his statement because he was still alive. And the coroner's jury said there that unjustifiable homicide. In other words, the guy that, that shot this Wendy Cahill had no justification for doing it. And uh, at that point, that would have been submitted to the coroner. And had Billy stuck around, the coroner could order that Billy be arrested, uh, most likely by the county sheriff, because although it was near Camp Grant, it was in Bonita, which was a town just to the south serving Camp Grant. So it wouldn't be a military uh, police that would capture him. But um, the uh, the county sheriff and hold him over for trial, you know, an official charge by the district attorney and then so on and so forth. Um, so this was a regular practice. Um, coroner's jury convened for Tunstall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so why is Billy's so controversial? Well, the first thing is. Somebody might, but we don't know where the original cor coroner's jury is. In other words, the document that was written by hand by somebody. And there are copies of it, which many people dispute are even copies of the original. But we'll look at some things that might point to the fact that they are. Um, there are copies of it, but there's not an original. And I've heard from someone someone, a historian, <clears throat> that said, yeah, the original exists and it's hanging in somebody's closet up in Santa Fe. In other words, somebody found it, took it, um, had copies made, and now the, it, it's owned by a private person. Um, and if that's true, I, I gosh, it, would we love to see it? Wouldn't we love to see the original? Even just to match up to what the photostat copies say, but also just see that this original document survived because for so long it was said and or thought that it did not survive. Um, 
But I wanted to know because that the biggest, aside from did it actually exist, the biggest challenge is who wrote it. And there's a pervasive story that Pat Garrett wrote the coroner's jury report and then essentially gave it to the people to sign. Um, so in other words, Pat had it done before the, the coroner's jury convened, which would be early on the morning of October, I'm sorry, July 15, 1881. Um, so I, I started thinking, well, how can we figure out if Garrett wrote this thing? I don't think he wrote it in his own hand, but did Garrett write it? Well, uh, I wanted to read some of the other stuff that Garrett wrote. And so uh, to see if there was any similarities there. So I'm going to share something with you now. <clears throat> this is the authentic life of Billy the Kid, little window rearrangement here, um, which probably many of you, and if not all of you, have read. This is on Google Books. You can read it for free online. This is the original 1882 version that sold 200 and, <clears throat> I don't know, 225 copies or something. It was a dismal literary failure for Garrett, um, but stands as, you know, kind of an important document of the time. Well, this is chapter uh, eight, and this chapter clearly was not written by Garrett. I'm going to read you just a small passage of it. We left the kid at the end of the last chapter, sleeping peacefully on top of one peak of the Guadalupe Mountains, and O'Keefe also asleep on a bench of another peak of the same range. The distance between them, airline, was not so far, but there was more than distance intervening. Canyons, precipices, crags, and brush to say nothing of possible band of savages burning with baffled hate and deadly revenge. Okay, so if you, <laughs> it's very poetic and, you know, full of prose and stuff. Uh, if you feel like Garrett wrote that, I would say, no, probably not. That's clearly Ash Upson, right? That's the, the you know, the newspaper man, the writer, the florid drunk um, that <laughs> that wrote the beginning of the book. And it's it's generally well accepted that he did. So I can't compare anything in the coroner's jury report to that. Um, but I can uh, later on in the book. And so I'm going to read you a small passage from the uh, final chapter of the book where he talks about killing Billy. And I'll show you that one as well. I had a hope, a very faint hope of catching the kidnapping, as it were, so that I might disarm and capture him. Failing in that, my design was to try to get the drop on him with the almost certainty, as I believed, that he would make good on his threat to die fighting with a revolver at each year. So, with the drop, I would have been forced to kill him anyhow. I at no time contemplated taking any chances which I could avoid by caution or cunning. The only circumstances under which we could have met on equal terms would have been accidental and to which I would have been an unwilling party." So Garrett states pretty clearly there, I wasn't looking for a fair fight. Um, and, and again, if you haven't read this, it's it's an important book to read. The, the vast majority of it is just useless and a waste. Uh, and uh, a lot of the Billy the Kid myths and fables came from Ash Upson's writing. But the last handful of chapters where Garrett gets involved were penned by Garrett or at least dictated by him. And you can see the tone there. There's much less of that prose and the literary style. And it's more of, here's what happened. Um, but I, at very minimum, Garrett says here, I, I wasn't going to face him straight up. If I found him, I figured he was going to fight out to the death and I didn't want to do that. So I was looking for any advantage I could find to fight him uh, unfairly. And that's probably what happened. So keep the tone in mind of that. Cause what I was looking for is, is there common phrasing? Is there anything that sounds like what Garrett read here? And I read the last five chapters. I'm not going to read them all to you, but you can do it. Um, I read the last five chapters and looked for some sort of pattern, some sort of phrasing, some sort of repeating, um, in order to say, hey, this coroner's jury report sounds exactly like this passage or this chapter out of the authentic life of Billy the Kid. 
um, and we'll uh, we'll see if we found anything. But again, if you haven't read this and you want to read the very first version, 1882, um, just go to Google Books and look up the authentic life of Billy the Kid. Um, and uh, you can just read it for free right on your screen like that. Okay. So we've got a little bit of Garrett in our... Oh, one other thing I did want to share with you. Uh, there's a... Uh, 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 an afterward. So let me find where it starts here. Yeah, it's, um, there it is. There's an afterward here, uh, that talks the, uh, there's, it's not Garrett that wrote it. I'm absolutely positively sure that Pat Garrett did not write these last few pages, and uh, when he writes it, he he comes uh, he comes across as being uh, almost like <laughs> like a social media dick, for lack of a better term. Like that's what you would get today: somebody who writes something and uh, you know expects no one to. Uh, it's called the addenda. Sorry. Uh, writes something and expects no one to question them and is very condescending and, uh, you know, uses uh, self-deprecating humor, but but only uses it as a point of, you know, defense against somebody else. And it's so out of uh, character, that uh, text, as to the parts that Garrett really wrote. Um, and it looks like it would be Upson. But Garrett would have had to sit him down and say, hey, I really want to come across sounding smart here, and I really want to give these people a jab here or there. Um, so uh, it was uh, pretty interesting. I'm going to read you just a little part of this, uh, which is on page 132 of the original, and I'll go ahead and share that out with you. All right. Uh, a San Francisco daily in an article which I have never seen, but only comments thereon in other journals amongst other strictures on my actions questions my immunity from legal penalty for the slaying of the kid. I did think I was fully advised in regard to this matter before I undertook the dangerous task of his rearrest, as I contemplated the possible necessity of having him to kill, but I must acknowledge that I did, did not consult with the San Francisco editor and can, at this late hour, only apologize humbly for the culpable omission. <laughs> the law has decided as to my amenability and its requirement to its requirements. Should the opinion of the scribbler be adverse, I can but abjectly crave his mercy. <laughs> so th I, there's no way Garrett talked like that, right? You you heard his writing before. You can read it for yourself. Um, was it Upson with the, the Upson, the wise ass, like now poking fingers at the press and people that, uh, uh, that, you know, question Garrett, uh, you know, did Garrett say, Hey, here's what I want to say, but I want to say it better than I can come on, Ash, really give it to him. I don't know. But it, it, if there was social media at the time, this would have been one of those long, serial tweets and then there would be like thousands and thousands of people you know bashing garrett or supporting him or something like that so uh, nice little aside there okay let's get on to the coroner's jury report so what happened that night well billy is shot and killed or not um and what happens is that they summon a coroner's jury milnor rudolph um is called from Sunnyside, which was is just to this, um, in my mind's eye, just to the southeast of Old Fort Sumner. It was just a few miles away. But Paco Anaya, who is a friend of Billy the Kid, he he wrote a uh, uh, he he wrote an unpublished manuscript. I don't know that it was ever completely finished, but it was found eighties, early nineties, nineteen nineties. And then finally published, and it was called I Buried Billy. Paco Anaya says that following the shooting, he and, uh, and his brother, Inyo Garcia, were called by uh, uh, Alejandro Segura uh, to be a part of the coroner's jury. Uh, before the jury, to be part of this first jury, before the jury goes to the house, he sees, or at least he says, he sees Garrett hands Alejandro Segura a piece of paper with the jury verdict already written by himself. Um, so 
the rest of the jury just signs the paper, never even looks at the body and then hands it back and it's done. But Garrett loses that paper. That's a part that's, uh, I, that's just got me crossed up. Like that's something so important. First of all, to make sure that you're not tried for murder, right? Unjustifiable homicide. Um, and then the second thing is you want to collect the reward. And the third thing is you want to prove to the territory that you killed this guy that you said you were going to kill. Um, but somehow Garrett loses it. Now in the fog of war, which would I would imagine would take place from midnight until they bury Billy the next day. You could misplace it, right? I, but it's a piece of paper. I I think I immediately put it in the, my coat pocket or somewhere safe where it doesn't leave my person. But I wasn't there. I don't know how uh, crazy it was or confusing. And so it is possible that Garrett did lose the original coroner's jury report. Um, and if so, we'll never know what that one said because Anaya doesn't say uh he he says that we we find that billy the kid met his death by a bullet which would which was fired from a gun in the hands of pat garrett that's it so he doesn't elaborate if there's anything else but basically billy's dead pat garrett shot him that's probably more of garrett's style of writing based on what we just read from the authentic life you know pretty direct pretty to the point but i don't think it's enough uh, the coroner's jury has the ability in the case of a homicide to determine fault and to recommend, uh, you know, culpability. And there's nothing in there like that. Maybe we've got a bunch of inexperienced jurists. We probably do. Maybe we've got a guy in Garrett that wrote the verdict and didn't realize that it needed to have more detail. Um, that could be true too. Uh, but at some point, if that ever existed, and Paco and Aya, his recollections are wildly all over the board. So it's really hard to take everything at face value. Um, but if he's correct, Garrett wrote this thing and then had it and lost it. But he may have had it and looked at it and said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. My head's a little more clear now. This sucks. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to. Nobody's going to believe just this like the coroner's jury would have said more i better go back to work on this so maybe he lost it conveniently in the fire and you know pete maxwell's fireplace if it ever existed but we don't know you can't prove a negative you can't prove it didn't exist uh, but we can't prove that it did because it's gone okay so whatever happens there's a second one or a first one, <laughs> second one, if you believe that, a first one, if you don't believe that. And we are, um, let me get the uh, names of the people that are on there. Uh, I've gone through this in my film. Uh, so Milnor Rudolph of Sunnyside is the four person of the jury. Antonio Saavedra, Pedro Antonio Lucero, Jose Silva, Sabal Gutierrez, and Lorenzo Jaramillo which is really close to the Luis Jaramillo that I'm trying to track down in Mexico, but we'll get there. And then signed at the bottom by Alejandro Segura, Justice of the Peace of the Precinct, I think it's Precinct uh, 27. Okay. Uh, Jose Silva, Sabal Gutierrez, and Lorenzo Jaramillo are all three illiterate and cannot sign their own names. That's not unusual, uh, you know, being out in a remote area in the 1880s, um, but they are still coroner's jurors. And so you'll see when I show you the document that their name is written and then they put an X between the first and last name. That would be their signature, essentially. They can't just put an X because you wouldn't know who the X was for. So somebody else had to write their names in there. Um, so we'll we'll take a take a look uh, at that. Uh, I'm going to read this. It's uh, a couple paragraphs. If you get bored, just go get a drink and come back. Uh, but it's listen to the wording. On this 15th day of July, AD 1881, I, the undersigned justice of the peace of the above named precinct, precinct, received information that a murder had taken place at Fort Sumner in said precinct. And immediately upon receiving said information, 
I proceeded to the said place and named Milnor Rudolph, Jose Silva, Antonio Saavedra, Pedro Antonio Lucero, Lorenzo Jaramillo, and Saval Gutierrez, a jury to investigate the case. And the above jury convened at the home of Luz B. Maxwell and proceeded to a room in said house where they found the body of William Bonnie alias Kidd where they shot on the left breast and having examined the body, they examined the evidence of Pedro Maxwell, which evidence is as follows. Now, before we go on, that's one sentence. <laughs> I mean, that is one long ass sentence. <laughs> I'm not sure why there wasn't any better punctuation used. Um, I don't know if this was the style back then to write a coroner's jury report, an entire paragraph in one sentence, but that's a lot. So here's Maxwell's statement. I being in my bed in my room at about midnight on the 14th day of July, Pat F. Garrett came into my room and sat at the end of my bed to converse with me. A short while after Garrett had sat down, William Bonney came in and got close to my bed with a gun in his hand and asked me, who is it? Who is it? And then Pat F. Garrett fired two shots at the said William Bonney and the said William Bonney fell near my fireplace. And I went out of the room. And when I came in again, about three or four minutes after the shots, the said William Bonney was dead. Close quote. Holy cow. That is also one long run on sentence. Um, it's got to be some sort of style of the time because <laughs> how do you even do you even say that? Like, how does somebody transcribe that as you're talking? They go, wait, wait, take a break. Let me put a period here. Um, and then it continues. The jury has found the following verdict. We of the jury unanimous, unanimously find that William Bonney has been killed by a shot on the left breast near the region of the heart, the same having been fired with a gun in the hand of Pat F. Garrett, and our verdict is that the deed of said Garrett was justifiable homicide. I'm going to stop there, that this, the deed of said Garrett was justifiable homicide, no charges recommended. And this is the part that crosses me up. And we are unanimous in the opinion that the gratitude of all the community is due to the said Garrett for his deed and is worthy of being rewarded. What? As part of an official coroner's jury, their job is, who is it? How did they die? And if they died of homicide, who do you think did it? But this group of people... Uh, some of which were not friends of Billy's. Probably Sabal Gutierrez was not a great friend of Billy's. But, you know, some of these other guys, uh, you know, Jose Silva, um, Lorenzo Jaramillo, and probably know and like Billy. And they say, they go out of their way to say, we are unanimous in the opinion that the gratitude of all the communities due to the said Garrett for his deed and is worthy of being rewarded. That's so far outside of the coroner's jury's, um, uh, you know, uh, roles and responsibilities. It really does make you look and go, who in the hell wrote this and why did they write it? So let's take a look at the, uh, I'm going to show you the last page because it's written in Spanish. Um, which I can't read very well. Oh, I, 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 who am I kidding? I can't read it all. I can pick some of the words out. And this is from the uh, Angel Fire site. Um, if you want to go look at it, uh, angelfire.com backslash NM backslash boy bandit king. And there's a lot of Billy the Kid stuff. It's an older site, but there's a lot of good documentation here. All right. So uh, I want to, can I make this bigger? That's what she said. Okay. This is the signature uh, part here. And the thing that's important to remember is that three of these guys are illiterate and cannot write their own names. And they are here, right? Jesus Silva, Sobal Gutierrez, Lorenzo Jaramillo, these three right here. And somebody had made the point that, oh, this had to be a copy of the original because all of the signatures are different, right? If it was made up, somebody would have written them in the same hand. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I've looked at this an, a handful of times and I don't think these are all individual signatures. I at least think whoever wrote these last three names is the exact same person. And 
if you uh, want, you know, some, uh, I don't know, uh, proof of that, look at the, uh, the G and the J in Gutierrez and Jaramillo. And look at the J, the long, look at the G here, the G here in Gutierrez, the G in Segura. I think Alejandro Segura wrote these three names in. Now that somebody had to write them and it could not be the men who signed it. And you can see their X, which is their mark, essentially, in the middle of their name, which says, yes, this is me. Um, so there's, I, the only thing is, these are not, in my opinion, I am far from an expert in handwriting, but I can look at the, you know, the way that these letters are formed. Um, if you look at the A's here, they also look very similar, although some of these are messed up. Um, but, you know, just the uh the, the little you know kind of a slightly angling down like this one and then the tail comes back up i mean they look very similar to me so if i look at this my best guess is segura wrote their names because he is the uh, uh you know he is the the uh the presiding official and then gives it to them to sign did anybody read this to those three guys did any of the other guys actually even read it when it was written or did and and know exactly what they were signing? And the reason I ask that is look at the handwriting of Alejandro Segura and then look at the writing on the rest of the document. I mean, it's it's definitely somebody else's hand that it's written in. I mean, this writing here, which is very strong, uh, very uh, uh, uniform, uh, kind of a you know thick, heavy hand, is definitely not the same handwriting that you see here. At least to my eye, maybe you see it differently. Don't know, but for certain, you know, this part. Uh, let's let's make it a little bit smaller. That's also what she said. Um, but this part here is, you know, just, just look how orderly, look how neat, uh, just, you know, really perfectly, clearly written, easily understandable. And then you get down here and it's this mishmash of, you know, very lightly written stuff. So, again, this this isn't an indication that the thing is fake, but it's an indication that at least whoever took pen to paper, it most likely was not Segura only him stepping in at the end and having it signed and putting these names here and then signing it himself. So that means that there's an extra hand in there. Did, did somebody else have great handwriting? Did Pedro Antonio Lucero have great handwriting? And everybody goes, hey, he's he writes beautifully. Have him do it. Um, you know, I don't know. Did Milnor Rudolph say, hey, I'll I'll write it out. And uh, then, uh, you know, you can sign it at the end. I don't know. I don't know that we're ever going to know. But it's, it seems very clear to me that one person wrote it and then everybody else signed it. And I don't know if everybody else read it. I know that uh, some of the guys didn't read it because they couldn't. So does it cast the validity of the document in your mind? Uh, into question. At least for me, I go, okay, there was a lot of confusion probably going on at that time. I don't know if there was another uh, document or coroner's jury report that was um, that was presented and signed and then lost. Um, but what I do know is that there's a number of different people, uh, a handful of different people writing this thing and at least three of the guys that sign it cannot read it. And I don't know that it's ever read to them. I don't even know that it's read to the guys that could sign it. Because it, it may have just been taken you know, from them and said, okay, tell me what you think. Yes, yes, we're in agreement. Well, great, then here you go. Uh, you know, we're going to sign this thing and... Uh, and we'll hand it off to Garrett and we'll be done with it, right? Uh, so really, uh, really, really interesting uh, document. If you want the original, again, that's the website to go to to have a look at it. 
Um, but that last bit that Garrett is, you know, we so appreciate him. We're unanimous in the opinion that the gratitude of all of the community is due to the said Garrett for his deed and worthy of being rewarded. I, I don't know that that belongs in a report. And if Garrett didn't write this, it sure seems like he had some influence on it being written. I could see Garrett at the end. I could see Poe and McKinney saying, hey, you know what? You're not too popular around here. Uh, maybe you better put something in there that these people really did support you and were you know happy that the kid was killed. And if you want that the uh, you know reward from the governor, then you, you probably better do that too. Like somehow somebody had a discussion and said, oh, right at the end here, let's make Pat Garrett look really good in a situation where at least in Fort Sumner, he probably did not look very good because of the people that um, – that you know were there and, and would have been friends with Billy. So what do you say? Well, uh, Colonel Maurice Garland Fulton back in the uh, 30s finds this thing, this uh, coroner's jury report that uh, has been missing for over 50 years and uh, makes a photostatted copy of it. 30s, 40s. Um, the original, we don't know where it is. We don't even know if the original exists anymore. Um, I don't even know if we had the original of this document here, would it even make a difference? In other words, could you go and say, no, this original here, I can tell by the paper or the ink was written in 1930, not 1881. Or could you date the paper and the ink and the style or something and say uh, with certainty that it was written, uh, you know, July 15th, 1881, just don't know but we don't even have the original to compare it to. We have photographic copies and now you've got them, you know, kind of on the internet there. But is that original hanging in somebody's, you know, closet in their uh, library? Is it in, sitting in a trunk somewhere in somebody's attic? Um, gosh, it'd be nice to know, but I don't, <laughs> at least until now, and we're 141 years after the fact, at least till now, we don't have our hands on it. So, would be nice. Hey, before we take a short break here, I want to thank uh, my buddy Fred, who's one of our uh, you know kind of loyal subscribers, uh, always commenting, um, and uh, his wife Janet. They came out to New Mexico yesterday to start their trip, uh, doing some uh, work through not work, but you know, so travel through Billy the Kid country, and uh, Fred. They just they were wonderful people. We had lunch, had such a good time talking Billy and other things. Fred's a woodworker and made me this. And I just can't tell you how how tickled I was to uh to get that because to me it's the ultimate insult. Not much, Marianne. Buckshot Roberts to Charlie Bowdry when Bow Bowdry comes storming out the door and says, throw your hands up. We're, we're going to arrest you. And Roberts facing 11 to one odds, you know, grabs his rifle and says, not much, Marianne, and starts firing, knowing he's going to die. Um, so April 4, 1878. So, Fred, thank you. This is going to have to go someplace on the set where it can be seen every time. Uh, and I'm going to be rearranging because I'm moving my office downstairs. So uh, this will this will grace a, uh, <laughs> a place where we can all enjoy the ultimate insult of the, uh, <laughs> of the 1870s. Not much Marianne by Andrew Buckshot Roberts. And Fred, I uh, hope, uh, hope you and Janet are having a great time on your trip. Hope you enjoy it. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back with some more Billy misdirection. In other words... How do you make something worth more than it really is? We'll find out right after this. Hey, everyone. If you uh, are uh, dead set on having your own uh, cool All Things Billy the Kid t-shirt, you have just one week left to order them um, uh, with original artwork by Mel Hubner. And uh, you can see them on screen here. The shirts are 20 bucks. Uh, you can order them at the link that's in the uh, show description, or you can go to the community tab and find it there and uh, show everybody your Billy the Kid freak flag. 
uh, with the uh, custom one of a kind artwork. Anybody who sees the back of that shirt as you're walking away is going to know exactly what you're into. Because if they're into Billy the Kid, that iconic image is one that nobody ever forgets. So thanks to all that have ordered. And you got one week until the uh, the uh, 26th, Monday, September 26th, to get your order in. And uh, so thanks very much for that. We'll be uh, coming right back in just a moment. All right. So uh, we talked about uh, the Billy the Kid's gun uh, that was uh, sold at auction for some $65,000, uh, really lacked provenance, and probably was not a gun Billy the Kid ever used. It probably was somebody trying to tack his name onto something to make it more valuable, which probably in the, I think in the sports memorabilia world happens all the time. And there's ways to ferret out that fraud now. Um, but uh, I got something uh, really cool here from Gary Wilson. Thank you, Gary. We're sending this. And this was a story from the vintage news uh, originally published by Ian Harvey in featured news. And I'm going to share this with you. Uh, but you see how easily you can debunk things if you just spend a little bit of time. And so the title of this is 10 cent banknote recovered from Billy the Kid's dead body could bring $500 or more at auction. Well, before you even go further, I'm thinking if it really was recovered from Billy's body, much like the Bowdry photo, photo of he and Manuela from his body, 500 bucks does not sound like a lot of money. Like if I thought this thing was even remotely uh, real, I'd, I'd pay 500 bucks for it and I'd put it in a frame and put it up on the wall. Um, but all you have to do is look a little further into this to find out the, the just glaring red flags. A 10 cent banknote is up for sale with a letter stating that it was re removed from Billy the Kid's body before he was buried. So that would have meant Billy had it on him when he... Uh, you know, went into the room with Garrett and then Garrett shoots and kills him or doesn't. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we, Billy doesn't have a vest on. He doesn't have a coat on. Sure. He could have shoved some money in his pocket, but why would he be walking around with a couple bucks in his pocket when he's going to cut a piece of meat? Um, and a 10 cent banknote doesn't sound like <laughs> very much. Um, Billy was killed 136 years ago. Uh, the note is reputed to have been removed from the body by Billy's close friend, Eno Salazar, who was a member of Billy's posse. All right. Well, Billy didn't have a posse. Um, he was a regulator for a short period of time. He was for a long period of time, but was legally deputized for a very short period of time. But Billy didn't ride in any posses in pursuit of other outlaws. And Eno Salazar was absolutely a good friend of his and was shot uh, three times in the escape from the burning McSween house. Uh, but Salazar spent the rest of his life in and around Lincoln. There's not any record anywhere that I could find that Enyo Salazar was in Fort Sumner when Billy was shot. So I'm not sure how he could have taken the, the 10 cent banknote off of Billy's body and why anybody would let him do it anyway. Like, would you really go, I'm going to rob a dead man of his last 10 cents? <laughs> Um, so that's another challenge. You go, wait a minute, the guy that took the banknote here wasn't even in Fort Sumner. And then if you go a little further, it gets even crazier. Although the note reads, although he had at various times stock worth thousands of dollars and made much money in other ways, yet Billy the Kid had only a few bills of low denomination on his body when he was killed by Sheriff Pat Garrett at Pete Maxwell's house at White Oaks, New Mexico. Whoop, whoa. Hey, now, White Oaks, New Mexico. I thought Billy was shot and killed in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and not White Oaks sitting north and a little bit east, I believe, of Lincoln. White Oaks was where Pat Garrett went to collect taxes and buy lumber, apparently, when Billy escaped from the jail. So all of a sudden, Pete Maxwell's house has moved all the way to White Oaks. And I guess Enyo Salazar could be there because that was much closer to Lincoln than Fort Sumner was. So Enyo Salazar goes to White Oaks when Billy shot at Pete Maxwell's mobile home that was moved there to White Oaks, takes the 10 cent note off of him. Um, and then the, this continues. Here is one of the bills taken from the body by a, and they changed the spelling in your Salazar before its removal for burial at Fort Sumner. 
So I think what happens is Pete Maxwell has one of those really nice class A RVs, the big things that looks like a bus, like a rock star kind of deal. For some reason, that night, he tells his driver, hey, I don't want to hang out in Fort Sumner. I want to go to White Oaks. White Oaks is where it's happening. There's a great disco there. They've got a lot of booze. I like to drink. So let's go, dude. Billy the Kid stows away on the bus somehow, probably hanging on to the undercarriage, and he gets to White Oaks. And what happens is Pat Garrett rides up to the RV, knocks on the door, the driver, opens the doors up Garrett walks onto the marble floors there's you know like bottle service and champagne and dancing girls and uh he says uh Pete let me talk to you in the bedroom and that's just when Billy climbs up through the escape hatch into the bedroom Garrett shoots and kills him Inyo Salazar goes oh man I missed the party holy crap my buddy's dead and uh, he goes, I'm going to take his last 10 cent banknote here because, hey, he's not going to use it anymore. And then Maxwell says, hey, let's write up this coroner's jury report while we party our way back to Fort Sumner so we can bury this guy. I think finally, after all this time, based on this article, we figured out what happened on July 14, 1881. And man, I wanted to be on the party bus but nobody invited me. <laughs> so thank you for your indulgence. But the point here is that these kind of things uh, happen a lot. People just, you know, uh, this thing belonged to Billy the Kid. Uh, you see stuff in museums that are attributed. These, you know, Billy the Kid did this, wore these things, those kind of things. Probably not. Probably not. Um, you know, there's no provenance for that. There's no provenance for this. And five hundred dollars for a ten cent banknote. I, I mean, maybe a ten cent banknote from the eighteen seventies is worth five hundred bucks on its own, which means that you know there's there's no attaching Billy the Kid to it, and so as such, um, you're just going to get whatever it's worth, and the person that buys it gets I don't know a good story or something out of it, uh, but uh, I don't know. So be on the uh, lookout, be aware. Uh, and be careful when buying Billy the Kid memorabilia because there ain't that much of it. Uh, and there might not be any left other than, you know, the stuff that Bill Bill Cook got uh, and, and, and maybe what's hidden away in a couple of private collections that we're not going to know about. I'll leave you with this last thought. If we took everything we knew for a fact, absolutely uh, documented fact or corroborated by contemporary people at the time and place that it happened. If we took everything we knew about Billy the Kid and put it into a book and then got rid of everything else that we thought happened, we hoped happened, somebody said happened, but there's no corroboration, how long would that book be? I think it'd be like five or six pages. I don't think there'd be a whole lot more than that. Uh, because Billy's actual, you know, recorded history is so small, uh, even though there's, you know, I mean, five or six pages might even be too many. Um, but, you know, look, absolute hardcore facts, those kind of things, there's not a lot out there. And since there's not, there's not a lot that you can corroborate when it comes to Billy the Kid's gun or his 10 cent bankroll or his bottle service on Pete Maxwell's class ARV. Um, and so, uh, be careful, but uh, keep that in mind. Anyway, thanks for joining me for this episode of All Things Billy. The Monday night show, uh, depending on when you're watching this, but uh, the Monday night live show is still going. We've got StreamYard software on board, so we'll be able to have multiple uh, guests, maybe even you. So when you log on to YouTube, you want to check and see if your camera and microphone are good. Are your camera ready? Do you have your makeup on? Have you shaved nicely? Uh, men and women and <laughs> oh god anyway sorry just joking around uh and uh, is your lighting good because we may invite you you may get a special message from me with a code to click here and join us live on all things billy the kid live on youtube monday night 7 p.m eastern daylight time so i hope to see you then and there and until then i'm michael anthony judas sissy for all things billy See you around.